um, you can't possibly put everything in a novel um, on the stage or in a film. Many, many disappointed fans of Harry Potter will tell you how the novels are as good as the books. Um, because you're really transferring to a completely different genre with, with different demands of, of storytelling. Um, playwriting um, is, is different, of course, it's different than prose, uh, specifically because you're telling a story with words which make up dialogue, but you're really writing behavior um, and action. So eventually you're going to run into the need to invent scenes that never happened in order to transfer them to the stage. In the words of another playwright, uh, Maria Irene Fernandez, eventually you have to make stuff up. Um, so of course as a playwright I make stuff up all the time, um, but it's my stuff. Uh, when I'm writing my own fictional plays, I can take the story in any direction, make it up as I go along, uh, dream it up, or, or take things from, from the world. I'm a little bit of a magpie. I, I'll take things from people that I know, um, my family members, things they say, uh, things that happen in the news, um, observations of life, uh, kind of a collage of lived experiences and made up stuff. But this step of imagining an adaptation is always a scary one for me, though necessary. And it's especially nerve-wracking when the person whose story you are imagining is a beloved local hero, a well-known activist, and sitting right in front of you. <laughs> So for me, it takes some courage to take that next step of imagining or inventing when adapting. Um, right from the beginning, Leanne um, had faith in me to do whatever I wanted to do with the story. Um, she gave me the permission that I needed to adapt her book. So I had two people that I felt like I had to um, honor and um, stick close to what they had done or written. And, um, and Molly gave me the permission I needed when I guess she decided to trust me. Um, and, and that really allowed me to imagine the story of the play. So I thought I'd share a little bit tonight about my process of adapting Molly's Hammer, um, uh, Molly's real story, and Leanne's narrative account of that story, Hammer of Justice. Um, Leanne's book details the events that took place on the morning of September 9, 1980, at the GE plant in King of Prussia, Pennsylvania, with the plowshares of eight. But for anybody, has, has who's read Hammer of Justice? Curious how many people have read it. Um, there's much more than that in the, in the book. Um, Leanne layers in layers and layers of history, the personal history of Molly's big family and their arrival to Pittsburgh, her marriage, her raising of children, the history of the Quakers and William Penn coming to Pennsylvania, the legal histories of World War II, the Holocaust, and the Nuremberg trials, more political. More recent political history, our government's nuclear policies, and details about what happens after a nuclear explosion, all supported by legal experts, and then some very in depth journalism and legal analysis about the trial that took place in Montgomery County, Pennsylvania after this action. So that's a lot for a play, right? Um, to continue to give you more of an idea of the scope and depth. Book, I'll read a small selection from the bibliography. Uh, the Counterforce Syndrome, A Guide to U.S. Nuclear Weapons and Strategic Doctrine by Robert Aldrich. Nuclear Weapons and International Law by Richard Falk. The Fate of the Earth by Jonathan Shell, which is a harrowing book I actually recommend about the after effects of nuclear holocaust. It's not light reading. The Risk of the Cross. Christian Discipleship in the Nuclear Age by Christopher Granis, Thomas Merton's The Nonviolent Alternative, Disobedience and Democracy, Nine Fallacies on Law and Order by Howard Zinn, and The Trial of William Penn and William Meade for Causing a Tumult at the Sessions Held by the Old Bailey in London, the 1st, 3rd, 4th, and 5th of September, 1670. <laughs> so it's really kind of specific. <laughs> um, in the beginning, I, in my research, I started to read my way through the bibliography and I thought I was going to read it all. Um, but then I realized, well, Leanne had read it all already and so I really probably didn't have to read all of it. Um, to back up a little bit, for those of you who don't know the details of that first plowshares action that the book um, details, how many people how, how many people know the story of Molly? Who are here? Well, most of you, right? Um, so the plowshares A 
paintings were made up of a Daniel Berrigan, uh, Philip Berrigan, both who were priests. Um, uh, Philip, I believe, by the time the action took place, had left the priesthood and had married and had children. Um, Anne Montgomery, a nun. John Shushart, I always have trouble saying his name. Elmer Moss, D uh, Dean Hammer, Father Carl Cabot, and, um, and Molly. And Molly was the mother of six, as they labeled her. Um, even though some of the other guys had kids too, um, but in, in some ways that was that was really important. That Molly was an ordinary mother, housewife in uh, Dormont, Pennsylvania, who joined a mostly religious and act, um, I guess, political activist. Although Molly was also for many years, um, uh, to call attention to what they were doing. Um, so at that time, uh, the way I understand it, um, because of the dangerous buildup of nuclear weapons, and there was a shift in US policy from deterrence to first strike, these activists felt that now was the time to take some kind of action to protest this buildup, but also to let the public know uh, what danger we were in. So in 1980, they walked into a GE plant in King of Prussia, Pennsylvania, and damaged two nose cones uh, for nuclear warheads that were being manufactured in the plant. By banging on them with hammers, they ripped up documents, spilled blood from baby bottles on everything they could find. They formed a, a circle, held hands, and sang until they were confronted by security and arrested. Molly spent three months in jail. Some of the others, I think, may have spent a little longer. Um, a trial followed that winter in which they were all convicted. Um, and then it was appealed, I believe. Um, the judge was prejudiced against their case uh, from the beginning, and there was a lot of inappropriate actions uh, from him during the trial, so they were basically prevented from presenting their case. But after about 10 years, um, there was a final trial in which they were able to present their expert testimony, supporting their reasoning for taking the action, and the case was settled, and Molly was sentenced to a year of parole and time served. Could have got some of that wrong. We'll fix it up in the Q&A. Um, or you could read the book. So how do you adapt this to the stage, okay? So suffice it to say, I saw many ways into the story, but for me, the most compelling was the emotional story of how Molly came to decide what she, to do what she did. When I landed on that, I realized that the sections of the book that, that detailed that emotional journey um, were really, like scenes of a play. I thought, I thought Leanne really uh, actually could have written the play. I, I, well, I'll, get to, I'll get to that. I suggested to her that she could adapt it, but I'll get to that later. Um, um, and I lifted a lot of dialogue that was in those scenes directly into the play. But this emotional arc in the book is really the heart of the story for me, and the part that I most responded to as a writer, and as a person, and as a mother. Um, Molly wrestled with her conscience, her sense of responsibility, an obligation to her family, um, conflicted with what she knew uh, about the danger she felt we were all in until she decided to join the plowshares and take this action. So this is like you know, the stuff of drama. Uh, writing a play is a lot like um, climbing a mountain. It's, a, it's an analogy I use a lot with my students. The first draft is climbing up the ascent, which is the hardest part. It's long and you don't know where you're going. Um, you, it leaves you out of breath when you get to the top and you can't believe you made it up there. Um, and then the revision, the development part, is the descent, which often takes much longer, but you can sit and rest a little bit as you go down. Um, but the very beginning of committing to a story before deciding to take that first step up the mountain is oftentimes completely unexpected. Um, people often ask me, where do my ideas come from? And I usually answer that ideas just fall into my lap. Um, but in this case, the idea to adapt Molly's hammer literally, literally landed on my doorstep. Um, I think it was maybe uh, about 10 years or so ago, I think 2007, maybe 2008, Leanne sent me her book, Hammer of Justice. Um, I think maybe Mark Masterson of City Theater or actress Robin Walsh suggested you send it to me. Um, with a note that said very nicely, would you consider adapting my book for the stage? 
Um, at the time, I, I think I had just finished, uh, I was in the middle of two adaptations, um, FBI Girl and um, another one called The Gift of the Pirate Queen. And I was getting ready to write um, Lost Boy Found in Whole Foods. So I had a lot on my plate. Um, but I dutifully read Leanne's book. And I was kind of blown away. I was like, I had no idea about Molly Rush. I, I didn't live here in 1980. I came to Pittsburgh in 1988. And I had never heard of her or, or had heard of this story. Um, and I thought, wow, there's, there's about a million plays in this book. Um, you know, how I, I asked myself how it would work. I definitely responded to the story and the characters and, and Molly in particular, but I felt sure I was not the person to adapt it <laughs> into a play. So I put it back on my shelf and every once in a while I would glance at it, but I pretty much decided I couldn't adapt it. I, and I even wrote back to Leanne suggesting that she adapt it. And you told me that you were writing, focusing on poetry now. Um, no, she wanted me to do it. <laughs> and I said, well, we'll see. And I, and I left it at that. Um, so fast forward to 2012. And as many of you will remember, um, there was the devastating massacre at Sandy Hook um, Elementary School, where 26 people, including 21st graders, were killed. Um, you know, this unimaginable, unbearable, unbearable to imagine event. Um, and I remember after, right after some time after the shooting, uh, the parents of the murdered children um, were forming an organization, which I think became the Sandy Hook Promise, um, which is dedicated to finding ways of fighting gun violence and uh, through um, both uh, 